Good evening, everyone. I'm curious how many of you were here this afternoon? Great, wonderful session. We had a wonderful session. I'm so happy to have so many of you back this evening. Uh, if you're looking at your program, I am not the new president of Grand Valley State University, <laughs> but I'm here to introduce her. All of us at the university are just thrilled to have uh, Dr. Philomena Mantella as our new president. She's been here since July 1 and already has made major impact on our campus and is full of energy and full of ideas and we're so excited that she is with us tonight and that she's also very supportive of the interfaith work that we do at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. So it's my privilege then to invite President Mantella to the stage. Thank you very much, everybody. It's my pleasure and privilege to serve as the fifth president of Grand Valley State University. And if I behave myself between now and November 15th, I will be installed as such. So <laughs> um, it's also my privilege to uh, recognize Don and Nancy Lubbers, who I, I know you all know uh, were the builders. I think of him as the builders of this university and a part of that is the origin of the, the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. So Don and Nancy, would you please stand up? Come on. Thank you. Thank you all for all you've done. You know, it, it's, I'm so impressed with this community and uh, there are so many gems that you find and the um, Kaufman Interfaith Institute was one that I was introduced to very early on uh, before I uh, started the job in July at the enrichment dinner when the Kaufmans really told their story of their passion, their life's work, their family, and the Institute. So I want to thank you for that because like many things in West Michigan, it was, it was very moving to me, um, your passion for this institution and the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm so impressed with the university community uh, with Sylvia Kaufman and her late husband, Dick, Dick Kaufman, for establishing the Institute. Grand Valley's honored them both and will continue to recognize their leadership in the interfaith work. Um, Sylvia's interest and commitment to interfaith dialogue and interfaith understanding became more public when she began the Jewish-Christian Dialogue in Muskegon in 1988 as a part of the centennial celebration of the Jewish community in that city. The dialogue has been held every three years since then and has expanded to a Jewish-Christian-Muslim dialogue when it moved to Grand Rapids and became a part of Grand Valley State University in 2006. In 2000, Sylvia's vision led her to contacting colleges and seminari seminaries in the area to establish the West Michigan Ac Academic Consortium, which now includes eight higher education institutions. Today's conference, featuring Dr. Elaine Pagel, who I had the joy of sitting next to at dinner and learning a little bit about, you're really going to enjoy the conversation tonight, is the 13th in the series. So Sylvia, you're a leader, and your initiative and in interfaith understanding has blessed this university, our whole West Michigan community. It's my pleasure to invite you to the stage to introduce today's program. Thank you. Thank you, President Mantella, and thank you for her husband, Bob, being with us this evening. And I'd like to welcome back all of you who were here this afternoon and the new people that have just come tonight. You missed a great afternoon if you weren't here, but you're in for another wonderful evening. There are several distinguished guests whom I'd like to recognize. Dr. Jesse Burnell, Vice President of Equity and, and Inclusion at Grand Valley. President Mantella already recognized Don Lubbers, 
President Emeritus and Nancy, who've been very supportive of the Kauffman Institute since before its inception. From Aquinas College, Dr. Robert Gilmore, Associate Director of Mission Ministry and Special Advisor to the President. From Calvin University, Dr. Elizabeth Vanderlei, Academic Dean. And we also have uh, with us the Executive Director of the Society of Fellows of the Aspen Institute, Warwick Sabin, and Elaine Pagels, our speaker, is a trustee on the board of the Aspen Institute. One thing I don't think I mentioned this afternoon is that the, the consortium, the eight schools that participate in the consortium, we plan our events collaboratively, we choose the speaker collaboratively, and then we rotate host schools. So the host school does not choose a speaker. The entire committee does. And we've been doing this since 2001. And it's been a great opportunity for these schools not only to provide programs of excellence, but to collaborate with one another. And they're in a 40 mile radius of, of each other. And before this, they'd never collaborated on anything. This evening's program will be very special. It will be a conversation about Professor Pe Pagel's new and powerful book, Why Religion, A Personal Story. Our own Franz Van Lera will engage her in a conversation about the book. And first, I'd like to say a few words about Franz. He is a tenured professor at Calvin. His field of expertise is the Bible in the Middle Ages. He also teaches a course at Calvin Seminary, and he's taught at Hebrew University and has had fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Franz has been an integral part of our Interfaith Dialogue Program from the beginning in 1991 and has represented Calvin since the inception on our consortium committee. I believe the first program we had was at Calvin College and it was with the guest speaker, Dr. James Kugel, and the topic was, what does the Bible really mean? So that was in 2001. When Dick and I lived in Muskegon, we spent some wonderful evenings together with Franz and his wife, Professor Kate. He had two young children at the time. It's hard to believe that his older son is now a junior at Calvin and his younger one is a sophomore at Princeton. He sings in the Bach cho Chorale of Grand Rapids and fortunately gave up his choir practice tonight to be with us. <laughs> and now it's my great honor and privilege to introduce our featured speaker and a dear and greatly admired friend, Professor Elaine Pagels. Please look at the program for a few of her many distinguished accomplishments. In addition to being the Harrington Spear Payne Professor of Religion at Princeton University, she's the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship National Book Award for Religion and Inspiration for the Gnostic Gospels and more. I met Elaine in Aspen several years ago and have tried for years to encourage her to be the featured speaker at one of our conferences. As I mentioned to those of you who were here this afternoon, the summer of 18, 2018 was a lucky one in this regard. I was seated next to her. She sat between my husband, Dick, of blessed memories, and me at the Aspen Institute uh, annual summer benefit. We competed to talk to her he about his doctoral dissertation, which he was finalizing, and me about our programs in West Michigan. Finally convinced her that maybe it's something she might want to participate in, but couldn't be sure. Elaine, again, thank you for your generosity in speaking here. It's great of you to do this. And she was sick last week. She arrived at 1 o'clock in the 1.30 in the morning at the airport and got to bed at 3. And she's been a, it's been fabulous all day. 
although I have read some of her earlier books. I found this book, Why Religion? Her Personal Story, very moving and compelling. It was a very brave endeavor on her part. It moved me especially because we had talked about it when we had dinner together in Aspen. She sent Dick and me the introduction and first chapter of the book before it was available for sale. I was moved at the time, but even more so when I read the entire book after I lost Dick in a tragic and unexpected accident similar to that of her husband, Elaine's husband, Heinz Epler. In talking to Elaine, she said she didn't mean to write a book about grief. That was not her purpose. Although you can tell she's grieving in the book, she's moving on and compelled to overcome. And to me, that has been very personally inspirational. Elaine, thank you. Please join us, all of you, in a warm West Michigan welcome to Professor Elaine Pagos. Thank you so much. I'm honored and moved to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, also for the introduction that, uh, well, it made me blush a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, Elaine, thank you for being here. Uh, we've tried a few more times before to, to get you, but it never really worked out. So I'm, I'm really glad that you could uh, make it to Grand Rapids uh, for, for today. And uh, it, it was a, a rough time coming here. You came in late at night, so um, if I see you nodding off, I will just um, <laughs> kick, kick your chair a little bit to keep, you, keep you awake. Um, we were here uh, asked to, um, to talk about your, um, your newest book, uh, which in many ways is kind of an, an unusual book to write for a scholar. Um, I yes. I read uh, your Gnostic Gospels, uh, The Origin of, of Satan, and, and there are many more uh, that, that I even haven't read. Um, but uh, this was an unusual book to write, and it's, it's also a book that must have been very difficult to write, uh, I imagine, as well. Um, so what compelled you to write it? And, and What's the story behind that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird and risky to write a book, you know, a, a personal book when you're a scholar. I was warned by some, an acquaintance, I won't say a friend, but he's president of a small college, and he said, well, if you do that, nobody will ever take you seriously as a scholar again. So I stand warned. Um, and people don't do that. But, you know, I, it's... it's um, Several things. First of all, why religion is a question people often ask me. Why, why do you do that? You know, why that? I mean, that's a weird thing to do. And so it's been a programmatic question because I was brought up in a family that was not um, particularly religious. My father had given it all up for Darwin the moment he discovered Darwin, um, and he. He said immediately he abandoned the ferocious Presbyterianism of his family, um, in which people were fighting about religion all the time. He just dropped it, said, nobody will bother with religion anymore. As soon as they know a little about science, forget it. Um, so I was brought up to think that religion was you know, on its way out. It hasn't happened that way. And, and to my parents' horror, I got fascinated by it. So that's what I do. But also because there are personal things. I wanted also to talk about things that had happened that I had, that had just gone into the background. You know, I said it was like a, a, a black hole in space, things that happened that were too difficult to look at when they happened, and I didn't have time anyway. So. But you know, as you get older, you, you can't just leave things like that in the background. They come back, 
Well, you can, but you don't live your full life if you do that. So that's why I wrote it. I wanted to allow those things to emerge and, and be able to live with all the experiences I had, and even those. Right. Uh, so, so you said you, you grew up in kind of an, an atheist home. Uh, and, and then one day you went out with a couple of friends and you came back with, with Jesus. Uh, right? That's what, right. Want to tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't totally atheist. My mother took us sometimes to a, a, a Methodist church. I must say it was a very boring one. It, it, I mean, you know, they said nice things, but there was nothing that really, you know, uh, it, it didn't stick right. much. Mm -hmm. But but then you know I was living in Palo Alto, which you know I I thought it, this is really the most boring town in the world. <laughs> um, when you're 14, it really is. And so uh, they said, well, they were going to San Francisco, and I thought, hey, that's great. I'll go to San Francisco. Who cares what they're going for? I didn't know it was a Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know who he was. <laughs> and there were 16,000 people in the sports stadium in San Francisco where I had seen Willie Mays, you know, hit the ball out of the park. And there were 6,000 more in the parking lot, and the roads were blocked for miles around San Francisco. Can you imagine that? It's really bizarre. And, and so then this preacher starts talking, and he said things that really startled me. He said he was going to say things that would shock the intellectuals and the sort of academic types, and it did. Um, he, said, he, he said, woe to America. First of all, I was brought up to think America was the gold standard of the world's morality, and, it was, and, and science is the greatest kind of wisdom, right? That was obvious, the way I grew up. Um, he was saying, this country is pushing its most brilliant sons, and of course the daughters weren't mentioned here, into, um, into building bigger nuclear weapons. And this wasn't that long after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the killing of 100,000 people. And I never thought of it that way, right? And he said something about um, Americans using the Bible to justify slavery and segregation. And I'd never thought about that either, because it, it didn't seem so relevant in Palo Alto, which was just, you know, as white as you could get. But it was stunning to me that he was saying things like that. And then there was this huge choir singing, Just As I Am. And then he said, Hen, you can have a new life, you can get born again. And I thought, wow, you know, you're 14. I just thought, I want a new life. I want, <laughs> I want to start all over, and this is going to be a real adventure. So, and I was very moved. So I went down and, you know, and accepted Jesus into my heart, and it was great. Um, my parents were horrified. <laughs> um, was it a way for you maybe to rebel against? Well, that as may well? have been a factor. <laughs> and so, for a year, I was involved with a very uh, intensely evangelical church. And there was a lot about that I appreciated. It opened up the imagination in a way that only the Wizard of Oz had done before. <laughs> and when I say the Wizard of Oz, I really mean it, because if, if you happen to be of sort of the generation I was, a lot of, of girls particularly read the Wizard of Oz. And you know, you could be Dorothy, you could be out there with the dog and the Tin Man and the, the Wicked Witch of the West. I mean, it was like, it was not just a story. It was a story that could interpret your life if you wanted some adventure and to get out of a boring place like Kansas, in which case hmm. I was in Palo Alto. It felt about that like that. Um, so, but but I'm, I'm sort of joking, but I'm not. I'm saying it was suddenly a different universe and, and a different sense of who you are and breaking through a, a, a world that seemed very... Mm, I would say monodimensional, you know, mm -hmm. into a like a three-dimensional world in which you could, there could be uh, other realities that, uh, that I was told didn't exist. So it was very exciting, and I was, and I was in love with it, sort of yeah. like falling in love when you're 14, and then I fell out of love with it about a year later. What, what 
caused that? What what start you oh, said in well, your book? You started to question this. What 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 happened? Well, I didn't start so much. It, I mean, you know, I was in that church. It was powerful, and it was um, an important experience. But then uh, a friend of mine in high school was in an automobile accident and was killed. He was 16 years old, and um, I went back to this church in Palo Alto, and uh, they said, oh, that's, that's terrible. Was he born again? And I said, um, no, he, he's Jewish. And they said, well, then he's in hell. And I was so shocked. I said, well, wasn't Jesus Jewish? Uh, it, it just didn't seem to matter. And I felt that what had drawn me to that place was not there. Um, I thought, this is not it. I don't belong here. And I just walked out feeling utterly desolated, and I never went back. So that's what happened. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was it. What I find quite interesting, though, is that apparently the Billy Graham that you heard, um, it's kind of a different voice also from, from ev evangelicalism that you hear today, right? That seems to be a little bit more critical of society, yet other things have stayed the same. Uh. Well, I guess it is. I, I haven't listened much to it these days. Mm. Um, but it, it was powerful. Well, I'm thinking he, of he, Graham Jr. Yeah. Oh, well, that one. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, it's different. Mm. That, was, that was pretty compelling. He was a powerful preacher. Mm. And it was a powerful message. Um, but then I could no longer live in that world, so yeah. I left and just decided to go to New York to become a dancer, because <laughs> <laughs> I loved modern dance, and my friends were all artists, and, and I thought that would be the best way to live. So how did you end up studying <laughs> religion? Oh, well, this That's is plan B. <laughs> I, I went to the Martha Graham School um, and took classes you know, because her, her company taught wonderful classes. And um, after a while, I realized that um, I was pretty good. But that meant nothing in New York. I mean, these other dancers were fabulous. And they'd started at the age of eight or something, and I hadn't, or five. So I just thought, no, this isn't going to work. Um, I don't think, that not that way. So. I thought, of what else? <laughs> what, can, <laughs> what else could I do? <laughs> and there was something about that experience with religion. I thought, what was so powerful about that? That happened years ago. I mean, why was it? Was it Christianity? Could it have been Buddhism? Could it have been Judaism? I mean, what what was it about religion that made that so compelling? And I wanted to find out, but I didn't want to get brainwashed, so I didn't go to a religious school where I was worried about that. Um, I went to a secular university, and um, <laughs> and the first thing I discovered, I wanted to find out, what do we really know about Jesus? What do we know about the movement? How did it start? Uh, who would join it? Why? How did it become what it became? And, and, you know, does it matter to me? I don't know. So I went, I went, and the first thing I found out was such a shock. My professors had file cabinets full of gospels that I had never heard of. The gospel of Thomas, and the gospel of Philip, and the gospel of Mary Magdalene, and the, all this stuff that, that I'd never heard about. And it had just been become available to graduate students and faculty at Harvard. And we were allowed to read this stuff. It was said, you know, um, top secret, do not reproduce. You know. So, so your interest, in what, what drew you to some of these, these well, as they are now called the Gnostic Gospels, um, it it's, wasn't pure scholarly. It was, um, <laughs> was it religiously motivated as well, these questions? Well, of course what it was. I it? mean, you know, people <clears throat> sometimes say to me, well, uh, are, are you just have an intellectual interest in religion, or, or do you really um, care about it? And I thought, well, you know, anybody here who, who teaches anything, it could be 
what physics it could be french literature or or you know chinese politics or whatever everybody here who does knows that you have deep reasons for choosing and loving the work you do because there's no other reason to do it you mm. do it because you really love it and i i just wanted to know this so it was partly religious and it was partly curiosity and sort of what was that all about mm. And then I, f I just love these texts. Yeah. Do you identify with these texts? I mean, we, we just heard a, a wonderful talk uh, in which you make um, the, the author of the Gospel of Thomas really come alive this afternoon. Um, do, you, do you think there's still a message there for people that needs to be heard today? Well, there was for me. When I read Thomas, and these, this claims to be, as many of you know, the secret teachings of Jesus. It's just a list of sayings that attributed to Jesus of Nazareth as his secret teaching, <coughs> which the, the New Testament says he had, but doesn't tell you what it is. And I came across saying 70, which says, where Jesus says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And I thought, hey, you don't have to believe that. It just happens to be true. And so I thought, what a remarkable text. What is going on here? So, And it was a huge discovery. It was sort of a detective story. Who wrote this stuff? Where was it? They said it was all heresy. It was all rubbish. It was thrown away in the second century. And good riddance, and I really loved some of this stuff. So that's why I did yeah, it. Yeah. So many people wonder very often, and they, they, they ask me, so you know, this Dr. Pagels, do you think she's Christian? Or <laughs> is she, you know, what, what uh, are you, do you consider yourself religious, uh, a believer? Uh, that's a very hard question to uh, Well, to it, it's not an easy question, because it depends on what you mean. Um, I'm more an explorer than a believer. I love Christian tradition or I wouldn't bother with it. And I find many resonances in it that I really like and some that I really don't. And I think it becomes important for me living in this culture which is very much shaped by it, for better and for worse, um, to make those discriminations and to know where you're being unconsciously affected by attitudes you didn't know you were being um, indoctrinated with, not by my parents in this case, but by the culture. One of the things that struck me in, in your book is also um, you seem to be extremely um, sensitive to spiritual dimensions. Uh, I'm sorry if I just put it out there, but I was struck by when you were praying with the monks at Snow Mass that you actually physically felt the power of prayer. Uh, do you yeah. think uh, that you this sensitivity may have drawn you to such a contemplative lot as the, the, the Gnostics were? Well, yes, and I never, you know, th these were Catholic monks, Trappist monks. I got to know them through, through uh, a secular Jewish colleague. It was Robert Mann. He was um, a violinist, a brilliant violinist, started the Juilliard String Quartet, and I met him in Aspen, too, and his wife, and found out they lived right near us in New York, and we became friends. And he said he was invited to become their first Jewish monk. Um, he liked the monks, and he was sort of fascinated by them. And so he said, well, he was going to play music for them up at the monastery, and he invited me and my husband to come and hear them play. And so I got to know them and was very moved by that Trappist way of life. But yes, I guess I would say I, I love Christian tradition. I, I now go to church, which I didn't for a long time, quite often, <laughs> sometimes. And, um, and, and these things matter to me. But a believer, see, I'm, I wrote the book Beyond Belief, mm -hmm. friends, because mm -hmm. that was written at a time when I realized that I didn't know if I believed in anything. Um, it was a terrible time of grief, and I just thought, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, God. I mean, what, what is that? 
what, what I don't know what that's about. I, it was very distant. In times of mourning, I found people would say, oh, your faith must have been now. Yeah. And I thought, no. In times like that, it was never more distant. It just seemed irrelevant or something, or just very far away. So I don't think of myself as a believer that much. And I don't ask that question. You know, I was giving a talk, well, we in Mich West Michigan ask it all the time, I think. I know. <laughs> well, I was, I was uh, at a talk and I t about, the Gnostic, about the Gospel of Thomas once, and a young man stood up in the back and said, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And I wasn't quite sure what he was getting at, so I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? And he looked really confused. <laughs> and I thought it was as though he'd said, do you know the secret handshake? Or are you part of my club? Or are we on the same wavelength? I mean, I'm not ridiculing it. I'm just saying he was asking a question that was important to him. And I couldn't say yes or no to it in quite that way. I'm more yeah. of an explorer, we, I guess. We like to put people in boxes, uh, which is sad but uh, but true yeah. well i think you see i also really have come to the uh, conviction that belief uh, okay i shouldn't say this here that belief is overrated <laughs> 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 that when people think about religion they think well do you believe in god do you believe in this do you believe in that now it's really only christians who do that most most Jews do it now, too, because many people get shaped by this Christian preoccupation with a bunch of beliefs. Um, but actually, in, you know, in, if you're Jewish, that's, usu that's not really the question mm -hmm. I would venture to say. Please contradict me. But the question is, are you secular? Are you orthodox? Are you reform? Are Practicing, you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, are you orthodox? You know, it's it's the degree of involvement. It's the degree of commitment. It's the degree of practice, right? Do you observe? Do you go to the holy days or do you not? Do you do, you do Shabbat or whatever? And the same is very true of mu Muslims often. I mean, it's not that belief doesn't matter. I don't mean that. But it's how do you pray five times a day? Do, you know, have you been to the Hajj? I mean... Buddhist too. I mean, do you meditate? Do you, you know, what is your degree of practice? How does this affect everything in your life? That's the question much more than do you believe in this or that or that? So I think that's why I say when I think about the study of religion, which I love to do, I think that's not a primary question yeah, yeah. for me. In, in a way, we, we talked about the let's call them the Gnostics. Some people say, well, there is no such thing as Gnostics. There are only a certain type of belief that people have in this period. Um, you, you emphasized their, uh, their contemplative side and their, their you know, seeking for the inner light. Um, there's, there's also a somewhat more uh, darker belief to some of these Gospels, uh, and that is that you know, some of these people who wrote these Gospels were really convinced that uh, Satan was ruling this world and that was probably not going to uh, change anytime soon, that this world was governed by the forces of, of evil and the best thing you can get is kind of get out of there. Uh, is that dark side of Gnosticism? Is that something maybe also that you, um, that you experienced? No, that... that um sounds odd to me because mm. the text that I love, I mean, the ones I focus on have nothing to do with Satan. That's okay. The New Testament has a lot to do with Satan. I realized that later. But the, the Gospel of Thomas, there's nothing about that. No, no. There's nothing in the Gospel of Truth about that. There's nothing in the Gospel of Mary about that. I mean, it just mm -hmm. isn't there. The, these are traditions that are about what I felt I was trying to do, Franz, which is having a sense of a spiritual dimension in life, okay? That's what I didn't have when I grew up. I felt I was living in a flat earth um, because there was no openness to 
the possibility of a spiritual dimension. And when I read poetry, certain poetry, not all of it, but John Donne, say, mm -hmm. or the music, certain music like Bach and Handel and, um, and black spirituals, that music has another dimension in it, you know? And that poetry mm -hmm. and those, the dances of the Hopi. So I felt there's a sense of a spiritual dimension that for me is very important. And it's not defined or captured by a particular set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. Is part, part of your book, uh, it's for a great part also about loss and, and grief. And um, to be honest, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I have two now adult children and just the, the thought that at any point in my life I would have to lose one of them already can almost bring me to tears. So I, I cannot start to imagine what you must have gone through. And then shortly after that also with, with, with Heinz, with your, your husband. So that sense of grief, what, I mean, you say, people sometimes try to say, oh, your faith must be so much of a, what, what did help you through that? What, how did you get through that? Well, that's a, that's a hard question uh, with a lot of difficulty. Um, the situation is simply that um, uh, our son was born with a heart problem and, um, and that was corrected by surgery and we thought it was just fine. And then when he was two, the doctors said they discovered pulmonary hypertension and they said this is invariably fatal. Um, and I said, well, how, what are you talking about? They, they said, a few months to a few years. He was two. And so we lived with that reality, and we adored him. <laughs> um, and we didn't have other children, so we were just utterly devastated living under that uh, sword, you know, that was, we were told was inevitable because nobody had ever survived pulmonary hypertension. Um, so that was very, very hard, and and uh, the work that I was doing in the study of religion became a kind of yoga. Mm -hmm. It was helpful in a certain way. And I was on the bioethics committee of Babies Hospital at Columbia Presbyterian, which taught me a lot as a medical outsider about what doctors can do and what they can't, because the cases we discussed in that committee were all about the things they couldn't do anything about. And my son was had one of those situations. Mm -hmm. So that's utterly devastating. Um, and I didn't think of I could ever get through it, you know. So what I, and then as you say, my husband un suddenly uh, died in a hiking accident a year later in the mountains. And by that time we'd adopted two babies because, because we knew that if we had never had children, we could have lived without children, because people do, and they engage other things in their lives besides children. But once you've had a child and lost a child, um, that's just impossible. It would have been for me. I went to a very good New York psychiatrist, somebody referred me to at the time, and he said, well, why don't you think of your students as your children? And I said, I'm not that neurotic. <laughs> 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 no, no, <laughs> that's not it. So we adopted two children because we needed children as much as those children in a, in a uh, orphanage in Texas needed parents. And that was helpful, mm. that was mm. helpful actually. Um, they sort of helped me through it because I had a three-month-old baby and a, and a year-and-a-half-year-old at the time my husband was killed, and that seemed impossible. But, because I adored him too, we'd been 22 years married, and he was a magnificent man. Um, but I had things to do, you know? Yeah. Get up yeah. every day, find the lost socks, Children them don't to give school. you any pause. Um, there. You yeah. know, go to the dentist. Um, the whole thing, you know. So, and I was working full time mm. to support us. So, that's part of it. But I really wanted to write this, 
as, I, as, as Sylvia said so well, not about grief. Everybody here knows about grief. Um, but the surprise by this time of thinking, you know, my life is joyful in, mm. in many ways, and it's, it's a full life. Well, those griefs don't go away. Somebody said to me, well, how did you ever get over it? And I said, well, what makes you think I'm over it? Mm. You do get through it. You can get through mm. it. Mm. And I do feel that that happened. So I wanted to write about the surprise that we can get through things we think we can't get through. And I'm sure you, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, um, is, is um, in a way, this whole, you said this is also when you started your book, The Origin of, of Satan. Uh, is there a connection there? Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, I never had thought about Satan much, um, but there was a there was a minister in Colorado after my husband's death who said, "Well, you know, you shouldn't be angry at God." He said this at the service for my husband, and I got really angry at him <laughs> because I thought these people here. They're scientists. They don't ever go to church. They don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Angry at God, that doesn't make sense to me. But I was angry. It was shocking and terrible, terrible. Nothing could have been worse, it seemed to me. Um, so I thought, well, in the ancient world, people would say, well, Satan does these things. Satan, his name Diabolos means someone who throws something at you, an obstacle, right in the middle of your path. You're going somewhere and wham, there you are flat, you know, and possibly destroyed. That's what they would say the devil does that. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll be angry at the devil. That seems innocuous because I don't think there's such a thing as a devil in that way. Um, you know, a devil's kind of a joke. Well, I sort of. I don't take evil lightly, but the devil himself, I don't know. I wasn't thinking of that. So I started looking at stories about the devil and how, when they started, realized, see, I always thought, raised nominally Christian, that in the Garden of Eden, the serpent represented Satan. That's what Christians say, right? <clears throat> a lot of us have heard that. But actually, in the Hebrew Bible, he's just a cunning snake, and there is no Satan there. And Satan doesn't appear in the Hebrew Bible in that way. Well, five times they mention Hasatan, uh, some, some, some angel that is seen as the accuser, the opposer, someone who does testing people. Job, you know? So I thought, okay, I'll look at that. And so I began to realize that that figure that is so insignificant, a sort of a storytelling device in the book of Job, um, actually, when you look at the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark, the first one written, Satan is all over the place, in case you didn't notice. The first chapter of Mark, the world is swarming with demons, and the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus and drives him into conflict with the Satan, it says. And then he says the kingdom of God is coming. And that's like a direct assault on, the, on, the, on Satan, on the evil powers ruling the world. This is the way the Gospel of Mark tells it in chapter 1. And so Satan tries to take him down. And... and then I thought, well, now, wait a minute. When people talked about Satan, they weren't just talking, people who speak about Satan, if they say Satan's trying to take over this country, they're not just talking about some supernatural thing up in the air. They're talking about people, and they know who they're talking about. They could give you names and addresses. I mean, they are talking about a spirit of evil, 
but they're seeing it embodied in certain people. So I thought, okay, how's this going to work? Satan seems to have a social history. I mean, he seems to matter in terms of human relationships. So I called it to myself the social history of Satan. So I started to read the New Testament. I thought, okay, how's this going to work? Well, you know, I, I've read the New Testament before, so I figured, well, the Spirit comes on Jesus at the beginning of Mark, and so who's identified with Jesus? It's Jesus and the disciples. And the enemies of Jesus will be identified with Satan, right? Because the whole story is a battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. So who would that be? Well, who would the enemies of Jesus? It would be the Romans who killed Jesus, maybe the chief priests who collaborated in the arrest. But that's not what I found. I started to read Mark. I couldn't believe it, frankly. I was so surprised that Satan was never identified with the Romans who crucified Jesus. Satan was only identified with Jewish enemies of Jesus. Judas, and finally with the crowds, and finally with um, Cephas. Yeah. With Cephas. Uh, the, yeah. the chief priest, yeah. right? The, the Jewish enemies of Jesus were identified with Satan, but never the Romans. And historically speaking, that makes no sense because the Romans crucified Jesus on charges of sedition against Rome. And there, were, there may have been Jewish leaders who collaborated in the arrest. That's what, what we hear. The temple police were sent by because Jesus caused some major disturbance in the temple, and they had to get rid of this man. Um, but why would that happen? And what did it mean? And what I discovered is that when you go from Mark's gospel to Matthew's to Luke's to John's, that identification gets worse and worse. When you get to the gospel of John, it says the Jews hate the Jews were trying to kill him. Right. It's no longer the scribes. Uh, it's, it's no longer Jews. just the yeah. chief priest yeah. or Judas. It's not one or two. It's and then in Matthew, Matthew has mm. Matthew has a scene in which Pilate is being Mr. Nice Guy and saying, "There's nothing wrong with this man. I find no guilt in him." Well, look, he couldn't have been crucified if the Roman governor hadn't given the order. Nobody had the equipment to crucify people who didn't control the Roman army. Jews didn't crucify people. If they were going to execute somebody, they would stone them to death. But this was a Roman operation, and it had Roman purposes. It says right over the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Don't try it. You know That's the message. It's a meant to terrorize a subject population. And that subject population, Jesus was popular. That's why they didn't arrest him, for fear of the crowds, Luke says. And then in the next phrase, Luke is, the crowds has, have flipped. It doesn't make hmm. sense. So I began to say, why does that happen? And I began to realize that there were historical reasons for it. It's because followers of Jesus were in great danger. Because if you were a follower of Jesus in the first century, you were the follower of a convicted revolutionary against the Roman Empire. And that's why Peter was crucified, and Paul was beheaded, and his brother James was lynched in, in Jerusalem. And many others were killed by the Roman state over the next 300 years for being involved in seditious activities against Rome. That's what happened with the movement. So why? Did the writers of the gospel suggest that the Romans were fine with Jesus? The Roman governor wanted to release him. That's not a likely story historically at all. And I wasn't the first one to say it. But I was the first one to see that so Satan was associated. Anyway, so I began to realize that they didn't do it because they hated other Jews. They did it as a defensive maneuver to say, Look, we are followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and I know you think that he was a seditionist and a revolutionary against Rome, but really, he wasn't. The governor knew it. Everybody knew it. It was a quarrel between Jews. It had nothing to do with you Romans, so we are not revolutionaries, and we are not against Rome. Please don't kill us. 
it was a defensive maneuver. But, right, and that's where Christer Stendhal came in. I was really quite terrified of discovering this. I thought, what is going on here? And but I was invited to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and they asked me to give a lecture. And I said, well, if I could talk about this at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, that's going to be interesting. And David Hartman invited me, and I did. And then Christer Stendhal invited me to Harvard to talk about it. And he pointed out, he said, it was a defensive maneuver in the first century. But in the fourth century, when a Roman emperor became the emperor became a Christian. Then, it, within 50 years, the legal codes of Rome, he wanted to Christianize the Roman Empire. And it became a capital crime to convert someone to Judaism by Roman law by the year 367 or 371, Theodosian Code. Not with Constantine, but after that. So then you, you I thought, oh my, I, I didn't believe I had started with folk tales and stumbled on what I felt was the origin of Christian anti Semitism or anti Judaism, more accurately. But what a legacy. What a terrible yeah. legacy. Yeah. In, so anyway, that's what I wrote. And that, that came out of my grief and my anger at Satan, which I thought was innocuous, and, and sort of you know dealing with old folk tales, and they landed me right back in the real world. And so that's why the study of religion is not just about ideas and imagination. It's about how we understand the world, how we interpret conflict. And it's, it's really important to understand that. And, and I think Again and again, you've shown that stories are very often in that more important and powerful than, in fact, ab abstract beliefs and ideas. Yes, because when my agent <clears throat> read the book and my thesis advisor at Harvard refused to publish this because he said there was nothing anti-Jewish about Christianity, although he had been a German in the Nazi army, um, he refused to publish it, but other people immediately did publish it. And I realized it was inflammatory. Um, yeah. but, but I felt it was significant. And that's when I say, I love Christian tradition, a lot of it, but some of it we need to recognize can be very harmful, can be lethal, you know? Uh, other parts of it can damage people in other ways. Um, and, and it's sort of important to know that because we get influenced by this unconsciously, you know? And um, so my agent read the, the manuscript and he said he sat up all night. He said, I never knew why they called me a Christ killer in Boston. <laughs> I didn't kill anybody. I didn't know what they were talking about. But then I knew I had to publish it. So in, in a way that always also brings me to, to um, well, that was going to be my last question and then we'll have some questions from, from the audience. But um, the, the field that you study, Gnostic Gospels, it may seem arcane, and, uh, but what does it have to do with what we're doing here, interreligious dialogue? I think you already started to go in that, uh, in that field, but do you want to bring it in the present uh, time Yeah, well, well, you know, it's just that what was discovered with the secret gospels, 51 texts, not just the Gospel of Thomas, but 50 others, are ancient texts, a very wide range. And what they show is a lot of the context of early Christianity, just like the Dead Sea Scrolls showed a lot about Jewish groups that we didn't know. We didn't know much about the people of the Dead Sea the Qumran community, the Essenes, as they're called, the Holy Ones, and what they were doing out in the desert. But now we're studying a lot about what happened and how much more complicated, and that, that what they, there were different Jewish groups with different perspectives, as there are now. 
and that there were different Christian groups with different perspectives, a much wider historical context. So now we understand a lot more about how what we call Orthodox Christianity emerged and from what, and who was on the other side and what things they were saying and what things they weren't saying. So I think it's wonderful to have this amplify our understanding of these traditions. It, it certainly helps me. Yeah. Thank you. I want to uh, see if there are questions from the, uh, from the audience. So getting back to the, the loss of your child and your husband, um, <clears throat> it seemed like the conversation went from that to a study of Satan that became an interesting intellectual and historical discovery. Yeah. Um, but I'm still wondering, like, yeah. personally, how you grappled with that. You said you didn't relate to the concept of anger at God, but how did your religion or spirituality come into play in terms of how you dealt with those losses? Thank you. That You're right. It's, it's much more than that. That was a piece of it. But, you know, you're emotionally devastated. I couldn't function at all for a while had to raise the children and move them from New York, um, where my husband was was teaching um, theoretical physics. And now I was teaching at Princeton. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 um, oh, I was just, let me get, I had a thought and it just vanished. One of the hardest things about the grief that's involved with any loss, people talk about survivor's guilt, right? Mm -hmm. But if the loss is your child, there's much more than that. Because your job as a parent is to keep the child alive. That's really bottom line, right? And if you can't do that, you feel that you failed as a parent, no matter what the circumstances. And so there was mixed with devastating grief, um, a sense of guilt. Even though my best friend said to me right after it happened, she said, well, obviously you had nothing to do with it or it wouldn't have happened this way. And I thought, well, that's pretty basic, but but how do you deal with guilt about that um, if you can't prevent the loss of a, the death of a child? I realized this is part of an intellectual thing, conceptual thing, but it's in the Bible, right? The Bible has taught us. Well, take I, I read the story of David and Bathsheba. And you know the story. David desires this woman who's married to his commander and makes sure the man is killed so that he can take the woman. He takes her. They have a, they have a baby. And it says, and the Lord smote the, the infant because of the sin of David and Bathsheba, which was their sexual sin and the killing of her husband. So what it says is the reason the baby died is the parent's fault. And Genesis also says we wouldn't die if somebody hadn't done something wrong. Death is a punishment. And that's a very hard burden to add to grief. And I had to, I had to learn how to let that go and realize that I'd been taught that by my culture and deal with also the anger. I, there was an anthropologist who talked about that. And there's just a huge emotional um, turmoil. So I got through it with great difficulty and with help from a lot of friends, uh, dealing with the children every day. And I could only write this like nearly 30 years after it happened mm -hmm. because it was so deeply buried. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, then it, and then the writing was also a helpful um, practice. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to say that to parents 
who had this terrible kind of loss, that that, that burden of guilt, which is so commonly felt, is not your problem. It's part of the culture. But it isn't just an intellectual process by any means, you know? I participated in spiritual activities. The monks at the, at the monastery taught me about meditation, which I had to do, or I just couldn't have possibly managed at all. Meditation and contemplative prayer. Um, I did a lot of yoga. I leaned on my friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow, you know, it finally um, gets into a different relationship, get into a different relationship with that grief. Yeah. And it, it's, it's not the weight that it was. Also, the other thing is, you know, I was reading this wonderful book, which many of you I'm sure know by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. Well, you know, it's an amazing book about a psychiatrist in Auschwitz, and he talks about how people who survive terrible things, much more terrible than I had to deal with, um, do so better if they have a sense of meaning. And as he said, it's not a question of finding meaning. You know, it's, can you imagine how awful it is? I mean, maybe some of you had this experience. Someone thinks, oh, you must have, have such spiritual lessons from your son's death. You know, and you just want to, well, never mind. <laughs> because no spiritual lesson to me is worth my son's life. I mean, it's just a terrible thing to say. But, but Frankel says what you can do is you can create meaning. And I thought about, for example, um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, right? When when your daughter or son is killed by a drunk driver, you don't just grieve, you do something to try to prevent those things from happening. Those Parkland students in, in Florida, when their classmates are shot to death in front of them, how can any of us imagine how that must have, what a horror. And yet they go out and they agitate and say, we have to stop using semi-automatic rifles for mass killings in this country. So they're trying to do something. And others who were heroes, uh, St. Mary of Paris inspired me. She was an Orthodox, Russian Orthodox woman who lived in Paris in the 1940s. Uh, very deeply devout Christian poet and um, when Jews were being rounded up in the main square in Paris, she went into the square and asked the parents if she could put their children in trash cans to save their lives. And she, they put some of the children in trash cans. The parents were taken away, gone. And she found families for those children. And this is somebody whose six-year-old daughter had died. And she said, this is, she said at the time her daughter died, meaning has lost all meaning. But then she did that. And she did more, which I don't need to go into, but I wrote about it. So she found meaning. So what, what my husband and I did was feel that we would find children who needed, cho needed parents the way we needed children. And we would give what we couldn't give to our son to those children. And that's what we did. So that was a matter of finding meaning. And at the end of the book, it was a moment of saying, oh, here they are, you know? Hey, they're now 18 and 20. I mean, now they're a little older than that. But, you know, when I was writing, and there they are, and they're all right, and they're my family. I mean, the others aren't here, but they are here. And that's something to rejoice in. Thank you.
in, in your description of your early days of upbringing, there's quite a contrast. I, I get a picture of your early upbringing was not spiritual. And then you became part, you in, engaged in the evangelical. And you use the word intensely in evangelical. And there is an intensity in your work. As a doctor in family medicine for 30 years, I know about transitions in young people as they become adolescents and grow in context. Could you expand on your sense of intensity in the context of your early days in a non-spiritual setting? You mean about what that meant? What, what, was, it, what was so intense? Well, it, it, was, it was an invitation to have an independent life and a different understanding of the universe and my, my reality and even who I was than what I was brought up with, which struck me as incomplete, you know? And also that idea of born again, you could have a new life. I mean, that's pretty exciting when you're a teenager. And, but it was also a life with, with, with a much, in a much bigger universe because I was, I was in a universe that, that now had a, what I thought of as a spiritual dimension, yeah, which I don't live well without. I think some people do, but I'm not one of them. Your, your <coughs> husband was a, sorry, <coughs> was a scientist uh, as well. Um, was that, uh, w did he have some of the same spiritual ideas and views as you, you did, or? <laughs> well, no. Uh, <laughs> when we st first went out, he was a very charming man. Um, and I m saw him when he was 17, and I thought, oh, <laughs> wow. Um, striking young man. And then, you know, I knew him for a long time before we um, got together and got married. Um, but he, then he, he was at elementary particle physics. He said, religion? Why religion? Why would you do something that has, why don't you do something that has impact in the real world? <laughs> and I said, well, why do you do elementary particles? <laughs> <laughs> And he was trying to understand something fundamental, and so was I, and we figured this out after, after a while. And I loved, I loved the world of elementary particle physics. Um, it's full of imagination, too. It's, I mean, these physicists have all these wonderful metaphors, and they live in a world of galaxies and universes and n-dimensional space. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And he was just a marvelous man. He had a sense of his own spiritual depth, but it wasn't conventionally religious. Um, but I loved his work, and, and he got very excited about mm. what I was doing, and we were very much in love with each other, so that worked really well. Uh, this one's a little out there, but the poet Rilke, if you've uh, read some of her work, do you have any comment on... on uh, her work or things she said in your life or your study of religion? Oh, Rilke, his, his work. Rilke is amazing. I love his work. <laughs> he writes about angels. He writes about, um, he's, a, he's an amazing poet. I don't have anything particular to say, but I do love the elegies, and thank you for that. And, you know, that's another thing. I think of religious language well, it's, it's like poetry. I'm not saying there isn't reality in it. <laughs> I think of it, Marianne Moore says that um, poems, a poem is in imaginary gardens with real toads in them. <laughs> and I thought, well, these, some of these stories, to me, are like Adam and Eve. It's like an imaginary garden, paradise. But with re human realities are being discussed. There are real things going on. We identify with, with those stories because they speak to us about fundamental themes in our lives. So I, I think of it somewhat like that. Back to your husband. 
do you believe that there's any place for quantum physics to bridge that gap between science and religion? That's a, a really interesting question. I am not up on it these days, but I, f I really, I don't know. I was just hearing about dark matter in the universe, and there's some very interesting speculations about dark matter and black holes. <laughs> And the, the physicist Stephen Hawking came and gave us talk in honor of my husband after he died in Aspen. It was called, and Hawking is a well-known atheist. He said, but, but his, ta his talk was called Black Holes and Their Children, Baby Universes. And I thought that was kind of lovely, the thought of something coming out of a black hole. But I do think that physics is a different kind of language you know, it, it doesn't ask the question, why? Steve, Haw uh, Steve um, Weinberg at the University of Texas says, you know, the more we know about the universe, the more we know it is pointless and meaningless. And my husband used to laugh and say, you know, Steve, physics is not philosophy, and it's not theology. Physics doesn't tell you that the universe is pointless and meaningless at all. It just tells you how elementary particles move in space. So the, they address different questions. So I tend to think that the question, well, Steve Hawking, I mean, I'm, and, and also Steve Weinberg talk about how the universe began. Weinberg wrote a book called The First Three Minutes, but he, he can't answer the question, is there an intelligence behind it or not? And Einstein would have said, yes, I call it the good Lord. <laughs> Einstein's belief there was a kind of intelligence in the, in the way the universe was, came into being. And, and Weinberg would say, well, that's nonsense. I don't think physics can get you there um, myself, but I don't know that much about physics now. I, I just think it's a different kind of discourse. So that, that's why physicists have such different views on it. Uh, that religion asks different questions, which is, you know, is this an intelligible process we're living in, or is it a random collision of atoms, simply? But, but I'm not the person really to ask ab about physics. I was only a delighted vicarious learner of those things. <laughs> so maybe some of you have other thoughts on that. Hi, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your book. Um, I read it as part of a book club and it was very interesting. Um, and I attended your afternoon lecture. And um, something I was thinking about was that I think your scholarship forces us um, to consider the historical circumstances of Christian faith um, the human work, the decisions, the inevitable messiness of human error that kind of went into the creation of our holy books and our traditions and our creeds. And this, of course, comes up right against the certainty and absolutism of a lot of Christian leaders. And I'm wondering if you can say more about that. One of my favorite lines in this book <laughs> was when you talk about um, an African convert, Tertullian, who, um, when Christian, other Christians challenged him, he ordered them to stop asking questions and accept what they're taught, famously warning that questions are what make people heretics. Yes, questions make people heretics. I love that. They do. <laughs> they do. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> the word heresy in Greek means choice. And heretics are people who've made certain kinds of choices. And I think some of the bishops thought, yeah, it's not a good thing to let people make their own choices. We should be telling them what they believe, right? So I tend to be heretical. Um, but I certainly love this tradition as well. So that's a paradox, but there's not well, in much... In a way, in you can only be a heretic <laughs> within a certain tradition, right? Well, that's right. You need a tradition to be a heretic. That's exactly right. I mean, and you see, what, what we now see 
is that Christianity isn't something like an amoeba that grew into a dinosaur. Just, you know, with, with all the, the, you know, the genetic information that now makes up a dinosaur. It's, it, it, it's a series, as you say, of very complicated arguments, discussions, reflections. Um, for 2,000 years, people have been discarding certain parts of it and interpreting others differently. And that's why we have Pentecostalists and Christian scientists and Baptists and Catholics and all the other different groups, Quakers, because people emphasize different things. And, and I think that's part of the richness of this tradition. Well, I, I think eventually we tend to think of religions sometimes as abstract things, but uh, you can't think of religion apart from the people who believe it as well, right? It's yes, a story of absolutely. People. It certainly is. And it's a story of, of how we deal with fundamental questions in our lives. I, w I listened to you this afternoon, and um, really quickly I could feel it, my body light up with listening to you, and this question I can't formulate quite right, but I, I was aware that that lightness came from hearing a woman in academia, which is um, not very common to hear such a masculine um, framing of the world of religion to have such a powerful voice from a woman. And I, I'm curious um, how you may see yourself um, in your, when you look back at your work and in your career, what were some touchstones for you that you saw? I am a different person in this world of this academic world and theology in particular, and that's important. This part about me is different and it's important. I'm just curious. Well, that's an interesting question. Probably would take more thought. I was certainly told I was different when I applied to graduate school, and I was told they would have admitted me if I were a man, but They'd had very bad luck with women because they always quit. Later I realized they encouraged women to quit <laughs> because they thought we couldn't make it. That was the first thing. And there were very few women in graduate school then. Um, but also, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm just really glad these days to see so much more opportunity for women and so many women who expect of themselves much more than most of us were taught to expect we could do or imagine or try and, and do it, you know. Uh, I'm, I think that's just wonderful. But thank you for that question. You also received quite a bit, your, your work has received quite a bit of, of backlash when you came out with the Gnostic Gospels as well, right? Uh, was there maybe also a, a sexist undertone uh, at that? Oh, well, I mentioned my mentor at Oxford, Henry Chadwick, in his review commenting in the Times Literary Supplement, saying, you know, women are very susceptible to heresy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> St. Paul said that, actually, he didn't, but Deuteropaul Paul said that um, in First Timothy and mm. Second Timothy, that women are easily led astray, you know, and they're weaker than men, and they don't have the same kind of intellect, so you have to understand that they're often gullible. Unfortunately, uh, we, we lost a son at 16. Same, and growing up Jewish and reform in Grand Rapids, was interesting to me, and it, it kind of sent a shock to me when I heard you make the comment about what was said to you about that, uh, well, your friend had gone to hell for being Jewish. It, uh, not a shock to me in saying that, but it, it just brings up, wells up to me. And, and it was always the comment that still struck me, not your comment, but when Nate passed away, 
And people would say to me things like, um, well, God had a reason for that. You know, the, the, I'm, sure, yeah. I'm sure there's a reason. And, and to me, it was always the, the, the challenge, not back as to what the reason was, but I knew what I had with Nate and how fortunate we were to have Nate and, and we're blessed every day with Nate. And it's just, I just want to know, how, how do you explain? Is it, is it, a, is it a rationale? It's when people come up to you and say, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm sorry. I'm feeling for you. I'm thinking of you. And it's just the idea of that when, when God is introduced into a, a moment like that, it's kind of a the shock. So what you said wasn't a shock to me emotionally. It just it, it awoken that feeling. Yes, I think that is so painful. People feel they have to say something nice. And I remember the the person who came from the police department to tell me that my husband had fallen to his death when I had two small children. I was preparing dinner for us that night. And he said, God never gives us more than we can handle. Yes. Said that as well. Yeah. And I thought, how do you know what I can handle? Right. How do you know that our son died a year ago? I was just livid. And I couldn't speak. But I was standing by the door of the deck, and I ripped it off its handles. And I don't know how I did it. But I think what it but does, it, it provides a strength inside personally to, to prove otherwise that, that whatever reason there was continues on. I it, don't, it, did, it didn't end at that time, but more life began in, in lieu of Nate. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if this everything happens for a reason works for me. Um, I, I, you know, my son had a disease that um, is un very, very rare pulmonary hypertension, nobody knows why people have it. It just happens once in a while. I don't think that, to, uh, to, uh, to imagine that God would do such a thing yeah. is kind of obscene, it seems yeah. to me. I just can't get it. Well, thank you. Hi, it's me again. Um, question for you. Just like quantum mechanics has challenged physical, um, challenge classical physics. And the more we know, we know a lot more today, 150 versus 150 years ago about the historical Jesus. And it was less than 100 years ago that we thought the Milky Way was the whole universe. Do you see with some of these writings that are coming about that Christianity will have to change over time or transform or start accepting more of these new insights? Because part, part, the, the, part of the transformation process of Christianity is about metamorphi and changing. And um, Chardin talked a lot about this. Do you feel that organized religion, specifically Christianity, will need to adopt some more of these influences and maybe accept some of these other contemplative teachings and stuff like that? It's a good question. I mean, I'm sure there are people who will never do that. <laughs> but, you know, as you suggest, these traditions survive by being lived and reinterpreted in different generations, and they do change. Attitudes about, about the universe, about the creation of the universe, about uh, attitudes about sexuality, attitudes about people of other races and people of other ethnicities and people of other religions. I mean, these questions are so fundamental, and, you know, you know, we live in very different circumstances than people did 2,000 years ago. You know, if, if we thought of it the same way they did two, well, but see, there's a pretense in Christianity that if you're, say, a Lutheran, um, that Martin Luther taught exactly what Jesus meant. <laughs> Justification by faith, mm -hmm. that was it. Um, if you're a Catholic, you know, the Catholic Church teaches exactly what Jesus meant. If you're Calvinist or Quaker, um, if you're Christian science, uh, Jesus was a healer, and that's what it really was about. So, I mean, these are different interpretations, and I don't find fault with them, actually. I think they're different ways 
we interpret our lives. And I think that these traditions do change. They have, and they are changing, as you know. In fact, I think we can see them change uh, right now in this uh, very room uh, as well. I think we are part of that change. Uh. Yeah, and yet, and yet, you know, the tradition is really quite powerful. And uh, Jewish tradition is the same way. It's, there are enormous changes from the time that the Hebrew Bibles were written or the 3,000 years ago, some of these traditions written down and probably, you know, told for a long time before that. So I'm not advocating change. I sometimes don't like it, but, <laughs> but it happens. <laughs> and and I, I think, you know, what you suggest is something that we recognize. Thank you. Elaine, you must be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also exhilarated to be here and really but enjoy this conversation, so thank you very much. I want to make sure that you go to bed early and uh, have a good night's rest as well. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for coming and for talking with us uh, tonight. <laughs> I would just like to thank uh, Elaine for a long and powerful day. It was inspirational, educational, and you can see by the audience that we have tonight, many of them who have been here all day long, and the questions that they asked you, you really reached us all in a different way. And Franz, you did a great job. I oh, never had you. my doubts about you. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. And Doug? Thank you and Kyle, Kyle, for just doing an outstanding job as in, in typical Kaufman Institute style of putting on a fabulous conference. And we hope to see you back next fall sometime. We don't have a speaker yet, but there'll be another consortium conference. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the day as much as I did.